My name is Patrick Deneen. I am a professor in the political science department uh, and uh, a faculty affiliate with the Constitutional Studies program. Uh, professor Munoz, who normally is our MC for these events, is off explaining the Constitution in Washington, D.C., where they need it far more uh, than we do here. Uh, but he did ask me if I could, with a, with a nice crowd gathered today, if I would also announce to you and, and ask you to put on your calendar a lecture uh, that will be coming up uh, in a short, uh, in, a, in a, just a number of days, uh, Tuesday, September 25th. Uh, I believe in this room, or maybe the room next door, Arthur C. Brooks, who is the president of the American Enterprise Institute, uh, will be speaking on a subject perhaps of interest to many of us. This, the topic of his lecture is called Bringing America Together. And again, that's on September 25th at 11 AM uh, in 1030 Jenkins Nanovic Hall. So I think maybe this room or the next room. Uh, I am, uh, I'm really delighted uh, to be here and to be, um, in some senses, a part of this moment. Uh, Professor Michael Zuckert. Uh, maybe for those of you undergraduates may not recognize quite how much uh, Michael and Catherine Zuckert have contributed uh, to the life of this university, certain to, certainly to the political science department over their many years of being here. Uh, and this is Michael, Professor Zuckert's, uh, Professor Michael Zuckert's last semester teaching at the University of Notre Dame. Uh, but not only in many ways because of the contributions he's made to our institution, but the contributions he's made uh, globally to the study of the American Constitution. There's really no one uh, that one can think of that would be better and more fitting uh, to deliver today's lecture. But I think particularly on this occasion where uh, we're in some ways uh, graced by Michael's presence uh, uh, for only a few more uh, months, uh, it's a really a fitting moment for us to, to have this opportunity. Um, I will be introducing uh, the, young, the young, um, young man, our student, uh, who will be introducing Professor Zuckert. Uh, his name is John Henry Hobgood. He is a member of the Tocqueville, uh, uh, Tocqueville uh, program, a Tocqueville fellow. Uh, he is a uh, PLS major with minors in constitutional studies and a uh, political philosophy, a politics philosophy and econ minor, PPE. Uh, but perhaps most appropriately and fittingly, he is currently enrolled in Professor Zuckert's uh, final course that he's teaching here at the University of Notre Dame, a course on John Locke. So let me ask to the podium, uh, John Henry Hopgood. Good afternoon. Like Professor Deneen said, I'm John Henry Hopgood, and as a student in one of Professor Zuckert's classes this semester, it gives me great pleasure to introduce him today. Michael Zuckert is a Nancy R. Drew professor of political science. He works in the fields of political theory and constitutional studies and has published extensively in both. His works include Natural Rights and the New Republicanism, The Natural Rights Republic and Launching Liberalism. He also co-authored The Truth About Leo Strauss and Leo Strauss and the Problem of Political Philosophy, both with Krath and Zuckert. And he has also edited the anti-federal writings of Melanchthon Smith Circle with Derek Webb. He is currently completing Natural Rights and the New Constitutionalism, a study of American constitutionalism in a theoretical context. His lecture today is entitled, Populism and Constitutionalism, Are They Compatible? Please join me in welcoming Professor Michael Zuckert. Thank you. John? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we need, may need that. Um, can you all hear me? Because I don't want to have to use that one that you have to hold. Yeah, I do. You can hear me. OK, good. That's great. Uh, so today, we are celebrating Constitution Day, as, Prof as Professor Deneen mentioned. And I thought I would just explain what Constitution Day is, for those who don't know. It's the anniversary of the day that the uh, members of the Constitutional Convention uh, finished up their work and signed the Constitution. That was September 17. 1787. So for those who are interested in such matters, this is the uh, 231st uh, Constitution Day that uh, we're celebrating today. Um, I'm, oh, I'm going to speak a little bit later of the American founders or uh, uh, 
draftsmen or however you want to call them. But I want to um, speak first, actually, about Abraham Lincoln. I'm going to start with Lincoln. I'm going to start with Lincoln partly because Lincoln was a great admirer of the founders, but also because what I think Lincoln has to say as he reflects back on the work of the founders, has a lot of bearing on our own present political situation. So I thought it would be a way of uh, making a connection between the founding and today via Lincoln. Now, so when Lincoln was a youngish man, not even really 30 years old, he gave a speech entitled, On the Perpetuation of Our Political Institutions. He gave this speech in the year 1838, just at the end, as you may know, of the presidency of Andrew Jackson. Now, Jackson, as you may recall, was quite a controversial president, known for his strong use, and many at the time said abuse, of presidential powers. Among other things, Jackson is remembered for having uh, promoted or being responsible for the so-called Trail of Tears which was the forcible removal of Native Americans from the southeastern United States to the West. Now, in 1838, when Lincoln delivered this speech that I'm going to talk about, he was a member of the Whig political party, which was a party formed explicitly to counter Andrew Jackson. In this 1838 address, Lincoln asked whether there was any reason to be worried about, as he titled it, the perpetuation of our political institutions. He answered somewhat surprisingly, given the way he began the speech with a survey of how wonderful everything in America was, he answered somewhat surprisingly that yes, there was indeed grounds to worry about the survival of American constitutionalism. The source of his worry was not Andrew Jackson per se, although I'm going to suggest it had something to do with Jackson, but Jackson was no longer in power, so it wasn't Jackson. It was not the issue of slavery, as we might uh, predict, because in those years of the late 1830s, slavery had not yet become the kind of con conflictual and disruptive force that it became not even 10 years later. And Lincoln insisted it was not foreign danger of any kind. What Lincoln was concerned with was the problem of mobs, or as he spoke more exp expressly, of mob violence. He argued that through their direct and even more through their indirect effects, these mobs constituted the greatest threat to the republic. Now, these mobs, he tells us, are not the outgrowth of any particular region or area of the country. They're everywhere. Uh, nor, he says, are they particularly related to the slave or non-slave parts of America. Although I should say, in anticipation of uh, the rest of the talk, that the two main instances of mob violence that he does speak of, one in Mississippi, one in Missouri, do actually occur in slave states. And he mentions none, particularly in non-slave states. Uh, this, um, he identified the two, these two examples, Mississippi and Missouri, as, to quote him, perhaps the most dangerous in example and most revolting to humanity. One kind of worry he had was especially visible in the Mississippi case, where, as he tells us, uh, well, first he tells us, by the way, that the, that, uh, the uh, practice of gambling had just recently been licensed by the Mississippi state legislature. But he's, he, w with that as a preface, he then tells us that the mob in Mississippi first took off after gamblers, then the mob moved on to Negroes, who were caught, as he says, and hanged in all parts of the state. Then the mob went after white men, who supposedly were allied with the Negroes. And finally, just about any unfamiliar person the mob came across, until dead men were seen hanging from trees upon every roadside. So Lincoln is calling attention to the fact that mob violence spawns mob violence. He's much concerned, we might say, with the contagion of mob violence. The other example that he develops at some length is an individual named McIntosh, a man of mixed race, whose fate was, Lincoln says, the most highly tragic of anything of its length that has ever been witnessed in real life. McIntosh, he says, was seized by the mob, chained to a tree, and burned alive. 
All of this took place within a single hour, he says, from the time McIntosh had been a freeman, uh, uh, tending his own business and at peace with the world. The cruelty, the arbitrariness, the injustice of mob action, these are the things, that, or at least the first set of things, that greatly concern Lincoln. But he considers the direct effects of mob violence, the things I've just been talking about, not actually to be the main danger to the republic contained by mobs. Surprisingly, I would even say shockingly, Lincoln almost dismisses these direct effects. Hang on to your seats when I read you this part of his speech. Abstractly considered, he says, the hanging of the gamblers was of but little consequence. They constitute a portion of the population that is worse than useless in any community. Their loss is never a matter of reasonable regret with anyone. Similar to, he tells us, is the correct reasoning in regard to the burning of the Negro at St. Louis. He had forfeited his life by the perpetration of an outrageous murder. And had he not died as he did, he must have died by a sentence of the law in a very short time afterwards. So Lincoln is belittling here the direct effects of mob action, in part in order to highlight the more dangerous indirect effects that he's going to lay out for us now. Just as there is a sort of contagion or expansive power to the violence of mob action in itself, so there is a kind of expansion um, of lawlessness from the original mob to other elements of the community. And that's where Lincoln sees the greatest danger. Um, the mobs, he tells us, by their example, encourage a group he calls the lawless in spirit to become lawless in practice. This group, the lawless in spirit, has no attachments to the law or to justice in themselves, but accept the restraints of the law only through, as he says, dread of punishment. Seeing that the mobs go unpunished, they, the lawless in spirit, lose their dread of punishment and act out as their hearts have always desired. Indeed, they pray for nothing as much as the total annihilation of government. From the lawless in spirit, the contagion spreads to good men, men who love tranquility, men who desire to abide by the laws and enjoy their benefits. Experiencing the breakdown of the law, these individuals, who Lincoln calls the strongest bulwark of any government, they become tired of and disgusted with a government that offers them insufficient protection, and thus they lose their attachment to the government. These, the ordinary law-abiding citizens, thus become open to experiments uh, in governance with strong men who promise them more peace and more security than they suffer under the present order. The path which the uh, along which the perpetuation of our political instruments, institutions is endangered is now clear in Lincoln's analysis. The mobs encourage the lawless in spirit to violate, violate the law, which in turn leads to the disaffection of the lawful in spirit and their yearning for order and security through more effective governance than the republic supplies. Now Lincoln's analysis, in, in my opinion at least, is plausible and is quite, quite a good fit for some of the 20th century political movements that we experience, say, in Germany or Italy in the 1930s. But one aspect of his analysis should make us sit up and take special notice, I think. The original mobs that he speaks of are not the same persons that he calls the lawless in spirit. These latter the lawless in spirit are liberated to lawlessness by the mob violence, but they are not at all the same as the mobs. The mobs Lincoln is concerned with are not the same as the mobs we might identify with rioters or others who become lawless in practice when they loot big box stores and walk off with 75 inch LED screen televisions. No, no, Lincoln's mobs are those who share, as he puts it, a growing disposition to substitute the wild and furious passions in lieu of the sober judgment of courts 
and to substitute the worse than savage mobs for the executive ministers of justice. Lincoln's mobs, in other words, are not common looters, but are groups who act in the name of and in order to effectuate justice. They believe that they are serving justice in place of and better than the officials who are charged with doing that. So his primary concern is actually with a kind of action that he calls mob law. That is, mob actions that, that substitute for regular and proper legal actions by regular and proper governmental bodies. Now that observation not only gives an insight into the scope of the problem Lincoln has in his mind, but also a suspicion of the most likely causes of this phenomenon of mob violence. Now in America, the idea of the people exercising political power is not, or at least should not be, strange to us. Indeed, we might say that it is one, it is even the official doctrine of the nation, because in America, we think of our system of governance as one of popular sovereignty. That is to say, we have the idea that the source of all governmental power is the people, and that the ultimate possessors of political power are the people. Isn't this the very meaning of the Declaration of Independence when it decrees all men to be created equal and that just authority or just government derives from the consent of the governed? But if a dominant part of the American conception of government since the revolution, if not before, is popular sovereignty, then why is the tendency to take the law into the people's own hands a phenomenon that Lincoln treats as rather new and different in 1938, quite a few years after the Declaration of Independence? He provides no explicit answer to that question in the speech, but the context gives us some idea of what he might have had in mind. He's writing during the so-called Jacksonian era, which is widely known in American politics as an era of democratization. Suffrage requirements became more democratic in the states. The rhetoric of the common man, of common man's rights, of his dignity, became the order of the day. Political participation through the vehicle of the political party became ever more widespread. Um, and the favored spoil system uh, became entrenched in national politics and made for more participation, actually, in governance than had been the case before. Uh, so the common people, um, uh, well, put it this way. The, during the Jacksonian era, the nation moved toward more directly empowering the people through democratic reform. So just as it was an era of democratization, so it was an era of turning against elites who were portrayed often as usurpers of the people's right of self-government. The so-called Republican or Democratic hyphen Republican Party of the, uh, Je of the Virginia presidents, Jefferson through Monroe, um, uh, became simply the Democratic Party, losing that qualifier Republican. Uh, the Whig Party, mostly representing the shunted aside elites, arose in response to the Jacksonian movement. So with the Jacksonian movement, the idea of the nation as based in popular sovereignty took on a new saliency. It was more salient than it had been in the founding era itself. So the political order that the founders put in place in their new constitution, whose formation we celebrate today, was constituted by a combination of the theoretical idea of popular sovereignty with a particular kind of elitism. In the defense of the new constitution that James Madison and Alexander Hamilton wrote, Madison explained that to be acceptable, the constitution had to be consistent with Republican principles. Now he went on to say that the word republic had been understood in many, many different ways through the course of uh, political thinking about, about forms of government. Um, but he went on to supply what he thought was the most adequate definition of a republic to that point, which turned out to be a much more democratic definition than was common at the time. In Federalist Paper number 39, he defined a republic to be a government which derives all of its powers, directly or indirectly, from the great body of the people, 
and is administered by persons holding their offices during pleasure, that is to say, the pleasure of a superior officer, uh, or for a limited period, that is a set term, uh, or during good behavior, that is to say, like the courts, for life unless some bad behavior is discovered through an impeachment process. Um, now, the point of this relatively complex definition that Madison supplies is this, that he's insisting that in actual governance, the primary sovereignty of the people be recognized. All governing officers are to be selected by the people or by persons themselves selected by the people. Lower level executive officers are to be appointed by the president who is himself indirectly selected by electors who are in turn selected by the people. This is a kind of uh, indirection, as you can see, but we can root it finally in the people themselves. Um, likewise, all governing individuals are limited in their terms of office, except for judiciary, so that the people can be and indeed must be consulted periodically about their governors. So popular sovereignty has a robust <coughs> presence, both theoretical and practical, in the constitutional order as originally established. The constitutional system was and still is answerable to the people, but the governors are not the people themselves. The people have a defined and a crucial role to play in governance, but they, and with them popular sovereignty, recede into the background except at those moments like elections when they actually elect their governors. And they're therefore more directly involved. Now this kind of arrangement was not satisfactory to everybody who thought about democracy. The good example is Rousseau, the French political philosopher who was the teacher of the French revolutionaries. Uh, Rousseau um, uh, would not settle for an arrangement like the American constitutionalism. As he said of the British constitution, often seen as a model of a free government. He said the British people think themselves free, but they are free only on that one day when they vote for representatives in parliament. Representation, which was in a way the keystone of the American arch of constitutionalism, was anathema to Rousseau, who considered rule by representatives hardly any better than rule by kings or autocrats. Um, so Rousseau, therefore, sought an arrangement more like what we or the founders would call a direct democracy, as opposed to a constitutional or representative democracy, such as our founders made. Now, the constitutional system, our system, of political institutions was set up to operate in two main ways. I mean, first, the first main way in which it was to operate was there was to be a selection process rooted in the people according to which the people would use their best judgment on who to put into, appoint into elective office. The system of elections was meant to stand in place of what had been the older and more purely democratic method of selection, that is to say, selection by lot um, or random choice. This method of lot, selection by lot, was char very characteristic of ancient Athens, but was used widely in other democratic or republican uh, uh, places as well. Um, this idea of selection by lot was thought to be more um, uh, responsive to the idea of democracy as ruled by equals or as a governance of equals. That is, all citizens were recognized as equally capable of governing, and therefore selection of them by lot would be appropriate. But the American idea of election or, was meant to bring the idea of merit, among other things, into the process. So that's the first way in which our system was meant to operate. The second way uh, is that the officials were to operate within offices, within offices which were strictly defined by the Constitution and by legislation meant to effectuate the Constitution, which uh, laws and structure uh, both granted and limited powers of the officials and placed each officer within a broader structure of offices where no single body of persons could uh, legislate, execute, and adjudicate the laws. Thus, the kind of heated and expansive action taken by mobs would not be possible in this kind of system. That was the idea. 
operating according to rules and to procedures, public officials would not act so cruelly as the mob in St. Louis did toward McIntosh, nor so irrationally as did the mobs in Mississippi. So the founders created institutions grounded in and answerable to the people, but emphatically not the people themselves. Not the people particularly operating independently of constitutional forms and formalities. Lincoln and most other Americans of the 19th century, looking at the very different outcomes of the American and the French revolutions, and the very different results of their respective experiments in, on the one hand, more direct democracy, and on the other hand, more representative democracy. Americans at that time had no doubt about which model, their own or the French, was better. So at the same time that the nation understood itself as a popular sovereignty-based republic, it also possessed a set of governmental institutions which, though derived directly or indirectly from the people, were just as firmly not the people themselves. At one place in the Federalist Papers, Madison emphasizes that the people in their collective capacity were wholly excluded from governance, with the exception of the jury system, where ordinary persons, more or less selected by lot, were in fact given actual political power to wield. But generally speaking, uh, the, uh, the, the founders found themselves or put themselves into the complex position of affirming the people as the source of authority, but denying that the people as such were fit instruments for wielding this authority that belonged to them. Now, the founders made a commitment to be governed by these officials acting under the structure of powers and offices as established in the Constitution. The commitment to the Constitution and the shaping of political officers according to the law of the Constitution was what American constitutionalism meant. When the people in Lincoln's case, in the form of the mob, takes over, the law tends to be overrun by passion and anger, by righteous desire to do justice, but also by an inability any longer to judge soberly where justice lies. So the structure of constitutional offices puts a damper on passion, gives guidance to action through the provisions of law, and imposes checks on the tendency to act impulsively. So direct governmental action by the people was opposed to American constitutionalism, even though the source of governmental power was the same people. For this kind of constitutional system to work properly, the people must accept both the limitations imposed upon them by the law and constitution, um, and also the responsibility that they retain for holding governors responsible, that is, they had to keep an eye on these governors that they put in place. For Lincoln, as we see later in his career, this translated into a kind of robust self-government, um, but also into a recognition, also into the need for a recognition by the people of their need to defer to the law as administered by officials. Lincoln was witness in the late 1830s to a moment when the dividing line between popular sovereignty and constitutionalism was breaking down. We can label that kind of breakdown populism, i.e. people attempting to exercise governmental power more directly than the system's constitutionalism normally provides for. Now the Jacksonian era was certainly not the only moment of populist outbreak in American history. There was certainly a major one late 19th century and we often think of ourselves as experiencing such a moment today, or at least so the pundits daily tell us. Um, Lincoln's analysis, I think, helps us to a somewhat more precise way to define or understand populism than the pundits, pundits normally provide. Um, and it also gives us a way to understand the periodic outbreaks of populism and now in America and now in other places that are like America. I know, not to go into detail about those. The analysis in the perpetuation address, I think, helps us to understand why Lincoln worries over such why Lincoln worries over whether such a nation can long endure, as he put it in the Gettysburg Address. On the one side, the success of the regime depends on the people keeping to their proper place. He outlined Lincoln outlines very well the consequences of their not doing so, the bad consequences of their not doing so. But on the other side, 
there's a constant temptation toward populism in the regime based on popular sovereignty. Because looked at philosophically, as say Rousseau did, populism is merely the people taking directly into their own hands what constitutionalism has placed in other hands, but which power, after all, truly, beling, truly belongs to the people themselves. So what, Lincoln, so what Lincoln is looking at with dismay and foreboding could also be described as a movement toward more democracy, toward direct or participatory democracy. That is the positive way to describe the swing of the pendulum toward populism. Now, given the way that populism relates to popular sovereignty, it's not a big surprise when Lincoln, in what otherwise seemed a stunning reversal, provided a kind of justification of the mob law that he also denounced so strongly. Recall his comment that, abstractly considered, the hanging of the gamblers at Vicksburg was of little consequence. Indeed, might have been a good deed. Um, and of McIntosh, he had also expressed a shocking excuse for the mob's action. So judging solely on what the mob intended in taking the law into its own hands, Lincoln gives us to believe that their action was just and aimed at the public good. That is the, thus it is clear why these mobs are not the same as the lawless in spirit, that is, those who uh, uh, obey the law only from dread of punishment. These mobs act in the name of justice rather than lawlessness. This, I think, is an important takeaway point from Lincoln's uh, presentation. The populist mobs are not moved by a s aspiration to self-enrichment as our looting mobs or by aspiration to anarchy and general lawlessness, but by a concern for justice. So Lincoln, to a degree, to a degree, rehabilitates and even endorses the populist activists. I say to a degree only because Lincoln maintains his view that through its indirect effects and through its liberation of political action from the constraints of law, it threatens injustice through the activation of passion and hot judgment rather than the more rational and cooler passion encouraged by regular lawful constitutionalist action. Lincoln, I think, overstates his approval of the mob's direct action in order to make his point about the intimate relation between populism and popular sovereignty. So up to this point, Lincoln leaves us with an important question. Why did populism just now break through the boundaries of constitutionalism? The background, of course, is the Jacksonian era, but that doesn't account for the actual events that occurred. In answer, he suggests a set of causes. The example of mob law, to which he gives most attention, I think, um, uh, it, it, the, the example of mob law to which he gives most attention is the hanging of the gamblers in Mississippi. I want to talk more about that. Why did the mob all of a sudden take the law into its own hands and start hanging gamblers and from there all kinds of other people? Lincoln himself says this can be understood as a spirited public action aimed at the common good. But he also tells us that these very gamblers and their occupation were so far from being forbidden by the laws that they had been licensed by an act of the legislature passed but a single year before. He deploys that fact in order to emphasize the lawful character of gambling, but he also insinuates something quite different at the same time. The Democratic legislature of Mississippi licensed the gamblers in the very recent past, but in doing so, the legislators seem to have been greatly out of touch with their constituents, with the very people who put them in office. Although I do not possess detailed knowledge of the situation, I do know three things that I think are particularly relevant here, and I'm going to mention them one after another. First, the people of Mississippi even more then than now, were mostly Baptists. <coughs> Second, Baptists are strongly opposed to gambling as a moral and theological evil. A resolution of the Baptist Convention from as late as 1984 goes as follows. Whereas gambling is an immoral effort that creates deliberate risks not inherent in or necessary to the functioning of society, 
Be it therefore resolved that we, the messengers of the Southern Baptist Convention, encourage Southern Baptists to work diligently with other Christians and other responsible citizens who oppose the spread of legalized gambling, and that we express our prayerful support and strong encouragement for those who are providing courageous leadership in vigorously opposing the legalization of gambling, both at the state and national levels. It is unlikely that the Baptists in 1838 were less opposed to gambling than the Baptists of 1984. Third point, third thing I know that I think is relevant. When the actions of a legislature go so clearly contrary to the clear preferences and sensibilities of their uh, constituents, there is usually a special explanation. In the 19th century, this explanation was usually called bribery. In the 20th century, it's things like campaign contributions or other kinds of special favors and benefits offered by interests that hope to benefit from legislature, special benefits offered to the legislators. There are, mo there are uh, 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 sorry. <laughs> In today's parliaments, this, ki parliaments, this kind of situation is called the swamp. The opposition to governing elites who benefit themselves rather than their constituents can be stated in the slogan, drain the swamp. There are moments, in other words, when the people wish to take back their sovereign power, moments when they believe that their constitutional rulers are out of touch with them, with their goals, and with their moral sensibilities. These moments are especially severe when the people suspect that the governors are really just out to feather their own nests. Now Lincoln points us then to the when and the why of the periodic outbursts of populism that have punctuated American history. That analysis should lead us to expect that so long as the nation is so conceived and so dedicated, that is to say, grounded on human equality and popular sovereignty, we can expect these periodic outbursts of populism. Lincoln's analysis of the close connection between populism and popular sovereignty is probably the most valuable lesson his populist moment has for our populist moment. One implication is that we should not look at populist outbursts as novel or freak events. They are, in effect, baked into the three-cornered political order that we have of popular sovereignty, constitutional democracy, and populism. Lincoln's analysis is both reassuring and worrisome. On the one hand, so far as populism is endemic to our kind of regime, and so far as we have arrived or survived past bouts with it, we can be confident, to some degree at least, that we can survive this one too. But far more overt than the reassuring implications of Lincoln's speech are his uh, very explicit warnings of the dangers inherent in the populist moment. Many details of his moment obviously differ very greatly from those of our moment, which I'm not going to go into now. But the, the, the danger that populism poses or the challenge that it poses to rule of law is something that seems common to all of them. So the populist disaffection of the ordinary good citizen is an outcome always to be deplored. But it can be especially serious, uh, it can be an especially serious challenge to our institutions when it interacts with another potentiality lurking in the American system. There exist individuals, claims Lincoln, of extraordinary ambition. These are not individuals who possess the ordinary kind of ambitions that can be satisfied by a seat in Congress or by even, even by the presidency. The founders, Lincoln sees, and if you'd all see if you read the Federalist Papers, built offices meant to be of sufficient power, of sufficient prestige, of sufficient uh, notoriety, we might even say, as to satisfy human beings of ordinary ambition. These people are not a danger to the constitutional order because they can find their satisfaction within it. But these more ambitious persons that Lincoln has in mind, these men are not so easily satisfied. He calls these men, the more ambitious men, they belong to the family of the lion or the tribe of the eagle, 
and they are not satisfied with positions created within a political order created by others. As, as he says, towering genius disdains a beaten path. These men, he goes on to say, find no distinction in adding story to story upon the monuments of fame erected to the memory of others. They do not seek fame within the constitutional order established by the Washingtons, the Madisons, and the Jeffersons of the founding era, but they seek to supplant the founders' political orders and set up new ones of their own. They set out to be the new Washington, the father of the country, or the new Madison, the father of the new political order. Now, nothing suits the aims of these very ambitious men than the populist emergence of a disaffected citizenry whose grievances and aspirations they happily serve in order to serve their own aspirations. As Lincoln said, these lions and eagles thirst and burn for distinction, and if possible, will have it, whether at the expense of emancipating slaves or enslaving free men. And that combination of the disaffected citizenry and the individual of lion-like ambition lies, in Lincoln's view, the most potent danger to our political institutions because the greatly ambitious individual has a will to overturn the established order and the disaffected citizenry is willing to sign on for the attempt. Now, as we attempt to assess this present populist moment, we must ask, don't laugh. Is Donald Trump the sort of towering genius who Lincoln warned against? The type of individual who can take advantage of populist disaffection and pose a genuine threat to our political institutions. I want to note at the outset, though, that Lincoln does not mean by the phrase towering genius what we would mean by using this phrase. He does not mean a man of towering intellect, an Einstein, say, but a man of great spiritedness or ambition. Judging from his own comments, perhaps President Trump has such ambition. He already has declared himself the greatest president next to Lincoln. He seems to aspire to even more. Does this mean he aspires to bring new political orders to burnish his own fame at the expense of the constitutional order? Perhaps yes, perhaps no. President Trump pursues policies that are controversial and distasteful to many, but welcome to many others. This disagreement, in my opinion, is a normal part of our democratic political life, and it should not be grounds for special concern uh, beyond the normal political give and take. Let there be robust debate on policies. Let us recognize real disagreements over policy and that these can be intense and very important to us. But let us distinguish these from other kinds of matters, for there are certain aspects of the Trump presidency that Lincoln's analysis and prescription urge us to take more seriously. I refer to various well-known things that are frequently pointed out, things as when he says, as he does on a fra fairly regular basis in attempts to uh, discredit the press, that the press is the enemy of the people. But as Thomas Jefferson said of the press, which, by the way, in his day was very partisan, much more so than our press, and especially vicious, quite vicious toward him, toward him, Jefferson himself, where the press is free and every man is able to read all is safe. The president also, our president, regularly tries to discredit the agencies of rule of law in our society, the Justice Department, FBI, and so on. He regularly speaks and acts as if the purpose of these institutions is to support and protect him personally and is miffed when they do not act as he wishes. What is most troubling, beside his apparent misunderstanding of his office, is the pass that his supporters and his party give him on um, these aspects of his actions. Presumably, they do so in order to protect him uh, to pursue policies uh, that he and uh, his supporters and his party favor. But Lincoln, I think, would urge us to distinguish Trump's policies from his threats to the Constitution and the rule of law. President Trump does indeed look like the man of great ambition, trying to whip up his populist base to go beyond or outside the constitutional order. Lincoln would tell us, in our circumstances, he would tell us this, I think. 
agree to disagree about Trump and his policies, but at the same time agree to agree about the value of the constitutional order with whatever its flaws has brought more civil, direct quote from Lincoln, more civil and religious liberty over time than any other in world history. Do not cut him slack. Do not make excuses for him. Do not seek partisan advantage by countenancing moves he makes that threaten the Constitution and the fundamentals of the constitutional order, such as a free press. If we remain true to the Constitution and the rule of law it provides, we will get through this populist moment just fine, perhaps even reaping some of the potential benefits of populist outbursts. In any case, Constitution Day is the perfect time to recognize and reaffirm the value not merely of the Constitution, but of the very cause of constitutionalism. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you so much, Professor Zuckert. Uh, we have about 25 minutes for um, uh, question and answers. Um, uh, it's the tradition of the Tocqueville uh, program in constitutional studies to uh, allow our, our undergraduate students uh, first opportunity to pose questions, since those are always the best questions. The floor is open. Wow. Graduate students? Can you talk a little bit more about things uh, President Trump might have done to undermine the liberty of the press? Um, and maybe make a distinction behind what, what happens if a president, um, well, let's say explicitly has views that oppose the constitutional order, a president that's against some constitutional, uh, some amendments to the Constitution say, well, we should amend these, get rid of these. And I'm imagining a president that's elected on a platform like that, deliberately challenging the constitutional order gets elected, so not like President Trump, I don't think, although maybe you have another idea, gets elected to do that, doesn't do anything actively to undermine it, even though he's an out and out enemy of this and that amendment or this and that part of the Constitution. And then are there constitutional essentials that you can't oppose versus maybe other amendments of the Constitution that you can oppose? And uh, how do we understand what becomes part of the Okay, that's a really, that's a sort of big question. There's a lot of stuff lurking in there. Um, let me start with your uh, candidate who uh, opposes certain features of the constitutional order. And I think here we have to make a, maybe a common sense distinction. Let's say if you're running, uh, you know, earlier in the day on a platform to move from state legislative uh, election of senators to direct election of senators. Well, this is unconstitutional, I mean, as it stands. Um, but I, I would say this is not a, it, it is a violation of the, con of the constitutional order the founders actually knowingly and intentionally established. But I don't think it's a threat to the existence of, of republicanism or constitutionalism in America. So. I would say there's not there's no nothing to worry about there, uh, and you know that happens often. We I don't know about often, but it happens certainly sometimes where candidates or parties do indeed have uh, agendas that run, you know, ask for constitutional change, and that in itself I don't think is uh, problematic. Um, but there are some there's some things that would be would be problematic, I think, and I think um, well to leave Trump out of it for a minute. Um, uh, policies which would, uh, or l let's say, an attempt to overcome the independence of the judiciary. I think the independence of the judicial system, including not just the courts, but Justice Department and other ancillary parts of the uh, judicial system, uh, these are dangerous and bad, and those should be opposed. Now, when there is, a, there is a piece of this story that we need to take on board ourselves, which is, at the end of the day, the survival of American constitutionalism is up to us, the people. 
that we have to do something. We have to do our part in the system. Even if our part is not to be the direct governors ourselves, our part is to hold those governors responsible and to hold on to the essentials of the constitutional system. So something like the Notre Dame Constitutional Studies Program, a very crucial enterprise within uh, the citizenship responsibilities and needs of this nation uh, should be encouraged. And many people, maybe all students at Notre Dame should major in it. Um, I don't think we have the staff for that. <laughs> Minor in it. Uh, uh, but I mean, I think we have to take, we have to recognize our responsibility in pushing back when there are things going on that are problematic in this way, which requires, on one hand, that we get some education in what those problematical things might be. Yeah. What, what would I leave out? I know I left out a lot of stuff, but is there something you want to press me to say more about? Yeah, what are the parameters of the constitutional essentials that you cannot, that we would say, to oppose this amendment, to oppose separation of powers, I suppose in the example you gave, independence of the judiciary, yeah. this is off limits. To oppose, okay, who elect senators, to oppose this element of federalism, that's okay, but not separation of powers. So what's What's your rubric for those constitutional essentials that, you know, if you had to teach your studies minor class, and you know, now you have a minute to answer the question, yeah. but what yeah. would those be? Yeah. Um, well, I think what, you know, one of the things, so we're, we're a democratic republic. So the idea that political power ultimately is responsible to the people, that's an essential. That there be elections, that there be, that there be a free press that there be, that the people not discredit the press in the way the president constantly attempts to do, because the press cannot fulfill its function if people are primed to dismiss whatever they find in the press that uh, the president tells them not to believe. That, I think, is getting very close to pushing at a constitutional essential. Um, you know, beyond, beyond a, few, you know, a few items of that sort, it becomes, you know, we have to see the circumstances raise the possibilities, and we have to know something in a broad way about the system in order to apply what we know to the specific issues as they arise. So if we had had this conversation five years ago, I would have never thought that we have to spend time talking about how dangerous and bad it is that the president is constantly discrediting the press. I mean, I just wouldn't have entered my mind as an issue. But maybe I would have had somewhere in there an idea that, well, if somebody did start to do that, that would be something to worry about. So I, I can't give you a, I, mean, I don't have a laundry list of those things. I'm taking, I'm teaching a seminar right now on um, James Madison to undergraduates. And uh, I think in that seminar, we're more or less, what you learn about Madison in that seminar is what you need to know. Another question for the students. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, to me, Lincoln seems like a strange person to invoke as a sort of defense of the Constitution. Because um, many people would say that when he was president, he overstepped his constitutional boundaries. And so, but that's not to say that he was completely untethered. In many ways, he was perhaps more dedicated to the, the Declaration than the, than the Constitution. So I just wonder if you're judging Trump on his sort of um, devotion to the Constitution, perhaps he's maybe redeemable in so far as like Lincoln, he's dedicated to something more fundamental or some more, you know, more basic principles. Uh, do you think that's right? Could you uh, find those maybe? Uh, no, I, I couldn't, but, <laughs> but if there were such principles, if that's what Lincoln is, if that's what Lincoln is undergirded yeah. by, is it fair to say that that's also a, uh, okay for, for someone like Trump? Um, l let me respond to that in, in, in two ways. One, uh, it's often charged that Lincoln, during the course of the war, violated the Constitution, went beyond the Constitution in various things that he did. That's true. Um, and I have two, I, I would make two responses to that. One is that, um, uh, you know, there's the old do what, I, do what I say, not what I do principle, which may be applicable. Maybe we want to say, yes, he, uh, he had the right principles, but he violated them sometimes, and we should watch what he said rather than what he did. That would be one answer. That's not the answer I would actually give, because I think actually Lincoln, and I've, I have a book on Lincoln that I've just finished, so, and I argue this out in some detail in that book, that the alleged violations of the Constitution that Lincoln committed 
were not actually, that he was correct on the constitutional issues for which he's most often um, criticized. That would be a long story. I mean, I just gave a talk, in fact, on Lincoln and habeas corpus in which I tried to argue that um, Lincoln, in fact, understood Lincoln had the correct understanding of the habeas corpus clause, the suspension, who had the power to suspend the clause, that he was right to think that he had that power. Now, that's not an argument accepted by everybody. Most law professors disagree with me. But um, I'm thinking that when my book is out there, they'll, they'll come around you know, <laughs> as, as, a, as one of the more rational parts of our society. Um, so I, I would answer that, that Lincoln was, in fact, extremely respectful of the Constitution and that he did all he could to remain within it, um, sacrificing his personal goals. I mean, to take an example, uh, early in the war, um, one of his generals, uh, uh, who was very uh, robust um, abolitionist, Oh, he, not a, he wasn't an outright abolitionist, but he's very much against slavery and very much wanted to bring it to an end. Took the opportunity as a, as a general in charge of a certain district in Missouri, took it upon himself to declare that uh, all the slaves in the state who belonged to people who were at all rebels could be, would be free here at, forever after. And this was a goal Lincoln had. He wanted to see the slaves free also, but he did not believe that there was a constitutional power for that to happen, especially for some subordinate general to make this kind of claim. So Lincoln made him rescind this order uh, and gave a pretty powerful uh, constitutional argument why this couldn't be done at this point in the war. Now, as we know, Lincoln later did that very, almost that very same thing. But he had a very powerful constitutional argument of what was different it, during, when he did it from the time before. And I saw there's a case. He didn't want to free the slaves any more uh, later on than he did earlier on, but he ex uh, respected the limitations that the Constitution put on his powers in this respect. And a lot of people are impatient with Lincoln for being so respectful of the Constitution, but I think th the record is he, was more, he, he restrained himself by his uh, sense of the Constitution. Um, there may be times uh, when you know, nobody can respect the Constitution entirely, that the world is you know, gonna, it's either coming apart or you, or you violate the Constitution in some way. I don't think Lincoln actually faced that situation, so, uh, but one, one might, and then one has to reconsider the situation it, under those circumstances. Circumstances do mean, do mean something. Yeah, Rob. Thanks, Professor Zuckert. Uh, wondering if you could say a little bit more about the relationship between the, the, the mob of citizens who are concerned with justice and they're taking it into their own hands and, and that of the lawless in spirit in, in these terms. Um, I think that connection is really relevant to today, both in the United States, because we see, for example, those who want to drain the swamp having some sort of uh, connection or potential affinity to um, white nationalism or, for example, in Charlottesville or in Europe. This is even far more pronounced where you have kind of the remnants of neo-Nazi parties, but who are also kind of combining with, um, with the populist movement who are concerned with questions that they see as bearing on justice and the um, uh, ineffectiveness of the EU. So if you were to advise um, the, uh, the, 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 the mob who's concerned, who wants to drain the swamp, those who are interested in things that they see at least as being connected with justice, on, on how to interact or, or, or how to perceive the relationship vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, the lawless in spirit, right? Because those will be connected in somehow. How, anyway, your thoughts on that relationship given our current moment? Well, I mean, I think I, would, I think I would say to both groups what Lincoln said, which is the better path is the path of following the law, lawful, lawful constitutional democratic procedures. I guess I meant if, if assuming that, that the lawless in spirit are just, they're more concerned about power, about outcome, that there's less of a concern with justice. In other words, you have people who are concerned with justice, but maybe using it in, you know, the means are incorrect, a group that isn't concerned with justice, but they have the same ends in mind. That, to me, that poses a difficult political problem. Well, I mean, as Lincoln puts it, the lawless in spirit are held to law obedience by fear of the law. 
And it seems to me to be uh, what uh, the lawless in spirit always need to have held over them, which is fear of punishment. And so I would say if you face with the lawless in spirit, you have to respond to them in the proper way, which is to bring the law and its force to bear on them. Okay, is that yeah. getting at what you're getting at? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, in the back. Yeah, question. Uh, thank you for your talk, Professor Zuckert. Um, my question is, uh, to what extent should the consequences of constitutionalism be weighed against the integrity of the process? Um, and I'll explain what I mean by way of example. Um, yeah. For instance, in the case of the toxic influence of money in politics, yeah. um, where there is a preponderance of opposition, um, yet it seems that the Constitution stands in the way of progress on that front. Um, so that's just one instance, but I'm wondering to what extent uh, do bad results reflect flaws or inherent flaws, if any, in the structure of the Constitution? Uh, good question, and there are there are. This is perhaps a good situation here because the people, the people we we would have to appeal to to change the laws with regard to the role, influence of money in politics are the very people who benefit from the influence, the role of the influence of money in politics. So. It's hard to ask them to um, do anything about it, uh, and um, you know those are those are those are really hard cases. I think, and there are not there are quite a few of them. So in in American politics, so let, let me give one example of an other uh, of another case of that sort, which was the reapportionment issue that hit the country in the 1960s. So there was a case where. There was unequal, very unequal districting between urban areas and rural areas in many of the states, maybe most of the states. <clears throat> and to go through the democratic mean, a democratic process in order to try to correct that was difficult because the people who benefited from the over-representation of rural areas were the same people who would have to change the laws, change the districting, and they were disinclined to do that. There's a case where the courts actually, I think, played a legitimate and valuable function because not having exactly a, a pony in either any of those races, they were able to take a more principled look at the situation. The role of money in politics, I think, is a little harder because there's a clear, there are clear competing what we might call constitutional values on both sides of that case. So the role of money in politics, it is, a it is a free speech or a free expression issue, as well as being an issue of undue or improper influence. So in the long run, you know, we, I mean, on the one hand, we have to say sometimes there just are not solutions within any constitutional system to some of the problems that the system faces, and that may be the thing. The other thing we have to say is that on this issue, as on many issues that we often get frustrated with Congress's in action on, um, I think we need to keep, uh, keep keep at it. I guess that's what I would say. Keep at it, and be more. I mean, there's plenty of room for electoral change in America because with our with our turnout rates, we're obviously not every citizen is doing uh, a job in in putting pressure on Congress or making their views known. So, there are things we could do that might change the political dynamic of it, and we should try those. Um, but I think sometimes we have to recognize uh, uh, that there will be, there will, there'll just be gaps in the system that can't get fixed. Or there is always the alternative that I, reper uh, re uh, I can appeal to my other course, my other, my Madison course that you're in, but I'm teaching a course on Locke, and Locke says in such a case we have the right of revolution, um, and um, we could try that, I suppose. Yeah, in the back. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Professor Zuckert. I'm, I'm very interested in this whole topic of populism because I actually, I just graduated from here last year working on campus now, but I, I wrote my senior thesis on uh, two cases of populism, so Trump in 2016 and uh, Hugo Chavez actually in Venezuela in 98. Um, and I was just comparing and contrasting the conditions under which they were elected as well as some of the strategies, some of the campaign oh. strategies they were using. So 
I guess what I was thinking a lot about during your presentation and during the whole writing process for my thesis was um, this distinction that populists tend to make between the elite and the people, the, you know, the common man versus the elite, the swamp, whatever you want to call it. Um, so I guess my question is, is, is it actually, is it theoretically possible or even actually possible to make those distinctions between the elite and the people? I mean, I thought you brought up an interesting example with the, the turnout. There's so many people in this country who don't vote. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the swamp, the elite, the establishment, all of that is part of our, our everyday lives. And mm -hmm. in some ways, we're, we're, we're part of it. We're, we're even complicit in it. So yeah. I guess, yeah, how, how exactly does, does someone make those kinds of distinctions? Between the elite and the people. Well, yeah. to some degree, that's a distinction that is self self. Uh, chosen, you know, some people chose to call themselves the people and others the elite and vice versa. So, so it's a hard call in, in that regard. But in, in some regards, it's clear there are some people, some groups, some pe people in society who have more power, uh, more political power, more sway on what goes on than other people. And I suppose that, I mean, that's a very imprecise kind of idea, but it's still, it's real. And one could use that, I think, as some measure of elites versus. Uh, in Venezuela, I would guess that wasn't maybe such a hard call, was it? I have. Where's Alejandro? You can respond to that part. <laughs> oh, I, uh, I'll leave that for later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So did you find that in your own research part of the issue, that people had a hard time identifying who were elites and who were people? Um, well, I, I think in the case of Chavez in Venezuela, it was it was pretty easy for people as well as Chavez himself to identify who was the elite and who was the people. Uh -huh. um, I mean, in that case, I found it to be more of a, uh, I guess, more of a socio. There was more of a socioeconomic aspect. So it was more the, you know, the wealthy versus the urban poor. And Chavez really took advantage of that by mm -hmm. presenting himself as someone who had come from an urban poor background and who was fighting against, you know, the so-called corrupt wealthy elite. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, let's take the example of those Mississippi gamblers again. Um, I mean, in that case, the the elite would be the people in the legislature who are, you know, benefiting presumably from some special benefits they're getting from gamblers who want to be licensed. Um, as opposed to, uh, you know, the rank and file, their rank and file constituents, who at least with regard to this matter certainly do not see themselves as elites. But I'd say in, in the general public discourse that uh, surrounds the use of those terms, usually is meant there's some people in society who have more money, more wealth, more uh, status, and more political influence than other people in the society. And that's a rough boundary line, but it's, that's, I think, what is usually meant when those, when those terms are used in normal public discourse. Uh, Professor Zucker, if I can just take the last question and then we'll let you go. Um, I'm actually, actually I'm building on this question. Um, given what you've told us that populism has been with us um, for a very long time, uh, and we see these eruptions I think you put it, it's endemic to our system, and we see these eruptions. I think many of us who are living through this moment at times feel that there's no clear path that we could see to the sort of uh, standing down of this current impasse. Indeed, what seems to be getting, uh, it seems to be destined to get worse, much worse before it gets better. Uh, we see a kind of ratcheting up on each side, uh, and uh, each side um, more or less um, arguing for the illegitimacy of, of sort of the other side right now. Mm -hmm. So given that your thesis is that this happens and this happens with some regularity, is there some hope for uh, historical precedent uh, or from historical precedent for what might be a source of moderation uh, that could um, assuage our mm -hmm. current concerns? Mm -hmm. Would that come from the constitutional sort of design or order itself, or does it have to come from some resource outside of the Constitution? And if, if the latter, do we have those kinds of resources mm -hmm. in the current mm -hmm. political mm -hmm. order? Um, 
It's funny because I, I just gave this same talk in um, Montana where I had never been before. It was an interesting experience to go to Montana. And uh, one of the uh, students actually, after the talk, asked a very similar question, although <laughs> he put it, well, he put it a little differently. He said, he asked me, did I agree that there was likely to be a civil war in America within the next decade or so? And I, I said, well, maybe it's wishful thinking, but I don't think so. Um, and uh, the, he was of the view, I mean, more or less uh, the background view that you were, which was that the thing, everything was getting worse and there was no prospect for people standing down. Um, it seems to me, I mean, you know, I don't want to go on record predicting anything on this issue, but, uh, well, I did predict, I guess, that we'll not have a civil war within 10 years. Uh, I think I'd stand by that. But whether we'll have a really calmed down political environment, that's one I think a little harder to make a prediction on. Partly, it's an example of, I think, the role of contingency in politics, which is to say, it's a, it, dep it all depends. What does Mueller discover, or you know, has he discovered anything that will make a difference? Um, what does Trump do next? Will he do something that will make a difference? And uh, since I don't know, know, I don't know those outcomes, uh, I, it's hard to predict how this one is going to play out. Um, but I do think, well, I'll mention one. I, I, it seems to me we don't play, we don't give enough role to the uh, power of boredom in politics. That is, after a while, people get tired of doing what they're doing and they start give it up and they start doing something else. Uh, and I think the level of intensity here maybe uh, will kind of calm things down a little bit. As So either one, one thing will happen. Trump will go on and the country will not fall apart. People will probably still oppose him, but the level of intensity of their opposition will dial down a little bit. Or alternatively, the people who support Trump will, um, for one reason or another, they'll get disillusioned with him, or they will um, realize they're, they're getting so much but not more. They're not getting tariffs, I suppose. Many of them won't want that, but not other things. As far as the broader picture, I think the, f the fate of these populist examples or instances of outbreak are rather like the role of third parties in American political life, which is to say every once in a while they, we get third parties and then they disappear. That is, we don't have an environment which makes for an abiding three-party system very workable. But often what happens is that the, what the th third party is pushing for gets absorbed by the other two main parties to the degree that, you know, to some degree, I don't, can't say uh, just exactly to what degree, get absorbed to some degree. And I think that is actually, in a way, happening even. I mean, some of the things that the, the populist disaffected, the disaffected populist want are, in fact, being adopted. And we'll see, you know, over a few years, what difference that makes to them. And some of the rest of us who aren't part of that populist movement may realize, well, it's not, not what we would have chosen to do, but it's livable. Uh, and so that, that too, I can see that as, a, as an outcome. So. Well, I think that, um, among other things, your lecture today makes clear that uh, you can't leave until you have made the constitutional minors requirement Global for the University of Global. Notre Dame. All right, I'm fine. Uh, that will give us a full cause and justification <laughs> for not letting you go. Uh, do yeah. join me in thanking Professor Michael. <laughs> Thank you all. <laughs>